This is Kate Rashney reporting from the AI Summit. I work for Dedicated and I stopped by the Neo4j booth to talk to Philip, the CTO of Neo4j. So I was sitting in the audience at the headliner stage, listening to the panel, and a few things came out of there for me, right? So you mentioned deterministic versus LLM. And just to explain to the audience, right, the LLM, the large language models, that's what allows us to get creative answers and kind of get, getting out of the box and having a conversation, feeling more like you're talking to a human. And then the deterministic the is really the rules, right? That it's not going to immediately rebook a flight first class just because a person is upset with, you know, missing their flight. So they have built- Bring it on. I, I don't mind that. <laughs> I mean, you'd probably like it. As a it. customer. <laughs> as a customer who missed a flight, you probably love it. But as an airline, you're building in those rules. Yeah. So- I think think of it as LLMs have very right brain behavior. What I mean by that, the right brain is creative, spontaneous. I don't really know why it's doing things. It's just kind of like acting. Yeah. And as you say, sometimes the first thing that pops to mind isn't necessarily the wise thing to say or do in any given situation, which is why for many kinds of problems, luckily for us, we have two hemispheres. Yeah. And Think of the knowledge graph as being, and the graph engine behind it, as being like the deterministic, uh, the, the discernment mm. and the, the knowledge that you can actually examine um, so that as the stakes get higher, you can use two hemispheres to solve different kinds of problems. And then as far as determinism, knowledge graphs are interesting because you can bring back context and then feed it to the model and let the model make a right brain decision in a way that's better informed. But you can also say, Look, for certain kinds of questions, I need an exact answer. And guess what? Like, there are many different kinds of compute techniques for coming up with different answers. And some of them can be arrived at in an exact way for complex, like, connect the dots questions. So if I want to do a supply chain question or ultimate beneficial owner in finance or um, HR hierarchy, Walmart, I mentioned in the panel, is a customer and has a, an agent used by 1.6 million uh, employees to do like career advisory um, to help any person find what the right path or viable paths are to any given um, new job that they might want inside the company. Th there is a limited and exact set of valid ways to get from point A to point B in your career. And what they do is they just have the LM create the query. So the LM is the translator from human language to database language, and then have the graph database answer the question, and then just pass that back. Okay, that makes sense. And you know, a lot of people call these AI agents kind of like a new, really smart new hire. They know everything, but they don't really know exactly what to do where. Would you say that a knowledge graph comes in and sort of adds you know, 15, 20 years of experience to yeah. that new hire? It, it can, like, I mean, knowledge graphs, I, I, sorry, LLMs I've also heard about, uh, you know, being like uh, drunk teenagers <laughs> at times, uh, which is yeah, why the right brain thing can be a little dangerous on its own. But yeah, what, what, what a knowledge graph can do in that context and where you can get much more intelligence is a new hire or even, a, you know, even someone that's been in a company for a while inside of a given department might only know things that happen inside of that department and not in other departments. And right. data is just naturally siloed. Yeah. The opportunity with a knowledge graph is to say, look, I'm going to connect up my data. And so what do we mean by knowledge and knowledge graph? It means it's not all the data, thank God. We're not saying you, don't, you need to take all of your data in a lake house and put it all into a knowledge graph. But why not? You don't have to. Like, okay. There's a place for data and there's a place for knowledge. So okay. knowledge is the signal and you don't need all the noise. Mm. So, And and why not? Is It's expensive. It's, yeah. It takes a lot of time. Maybe eventually you get there, but it's not... I, I wouldn't make that the North Star. The North Star is, let's take the data that's uh, the signal, not the noise, and connect it up. Okay. And that's knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and then... As an important part of that, I can connect the data across silos so that, all right, if I need to zoom down into my data and pick up some payload that's in a silo, that's great. But then with that knowledge graph, you can couple that with an AI agent and have you know, your LLM write, you know, you take human queries, translate them into database queries, bring it back, 
can uh, just, you know, essentially get smarter AI that's explainable, has discernment, knows what data is appropriate for what based on finer and access controls, and then has access to context. Yeah, you know, this brings me to my next question. For years now, we focused a lot on data literacy, data democratization, putting the data in the hands of the people, you yeah. know, the people who are non-technical. How does the concept of knowledge graphs actually help champion this? So one discovery that even for me, being a 13-year graph person is weird, though I've you know, spent a lot, a lot of time before that working on relational, is that models, uh, when you give a person inside the company the ability to access any data set and ask questions, very quickly a domain expert is going to start asking questions that are really complex, mm. which means if you're, you've got a SQL backend, your SQL queries are going to be like this long and then this long. And then this long. And then this long. I don't know if I'm outside the screen. <laughs> you are. I don't know if I'm outside the screen. <laughs> he said this long. Um, yeah. Incredibly yeah, huge queries. And then the LMs start to not be able to generate the query accurately or generate queries that are optimized or that just could, might take half a day or take forever to run um, and be slow and compute intensive and so on. And it turns out LLMs are better at writing cipher queries mm. than they are SQL queries. Huh for questions that are even moderately complex, let alone very complex. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard this from companies like Walmart, Uber, Adobe, that all have Comcast, that all have in-production agentic use cases with Neo4j. And so the, the democratization implications are huge. It means that now anyone in the company can ask very complex questions without having database expertise do to write. Do we want that, Philip? Do we want everyone to ask all the complicated questions? Are there guardrail security in place? Well, the, the good news is it's up to an enterprise to choose okay. what data to expose to whom. Mm -hmm. And for that, you can also have this idea of discernment of, I can still have fine range access controls. This is a Neo4j enterprise feature of very, very granular access down to even like a document level, like a person with this clearance should be able to access these documents with this, um, uh, you know, s s security uh, access uh, rights disposition. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Well, Philip, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. Thanks, Kate. The last question I want to ask is, where can my audience go if they want to start using Neo4j, get a demo, learn more? Where's the best place? Yeah. So you can go to um, basically Neo4j.com. There's a developer center. There's uh, you know, a bunch of learning resources out there. Um, you can go to uh, Andrew Ng's uh, deeplearning.ai and there's some, uh, you know, a couple courses there. You can go to graphrag.com is another good location. So lots of places for learning. Okay, and make sure you're following Neo4j on all social media platforms. Philip, thank you again. Cheers. Cheers.